Thank you for the nice introduction, Fred. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Liviu Kirku. I'm a developer for the OpenSIPS project for uh, like six years now. Uh, and I split my time between developing and uh, offering consultancy services for OpenSIPS solutions. And uh, today, we're going to talk about how to build uh, unified services that are easy to scale uh, using the latest OpenSIPS release, uh, which we did in May this year. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of topics, so I apologize ahead if I, if I uh, overwhelm you with information. Um, but uh, the, the premise is kind of uh, simple. It's that we simply want to grow as a, as a business. And uh, it would be preferable to be able to do it in a in an easy way, or um, uh, it, it would help a lot if the software would uh, make it easy for us to do that. So as we serve more customers and uh, possibly want to expand geographically and uh, throw out more uh, geographic points of presence out there, we uh, tend to have a need for the for some some unified service kind of like a clustered type of uh, type of sib service and uh, here is the, the our main preoccupation with open sibs 2.4 uh, and let me go through or does, is everyone here familiar with the open sibs cluster or could i get like could you raise your hand if you Okay, so this is going to be useful. Um, we thought that it would be helpful to add this layer of awareness between multiple OpenSIPS nodes, not just uh, you know throw them out there uh, in your infrastructure and uh, you know get desynchronized or uh, the idea is to avoid all that sort of problems. And uh, we came up with. Uh, binary protocol uh, application layer. It's uh, built over TCP asynchronous that allows us to both uh, maintain the state, so maintain a consistent view over the state of the cluster as well as to share data between nodes. And uh, yeah, it, it doesn't even need, we've even take, taken this uh, step further to the point where you don't even need to have a full mesh connectivity between your uh, your nodes. So take, for example, a topology such as this one, where you have uh, some pops thrown all over the country, but uh, the VPN links between them only link uh, certain locations. It's not a full mesh. Uh, and the cluster is able to properly share data between them, even in such a topology. Uh, moreover, it is able to cope with uh, some of the links going down and it will circumvent such events by rerouting the data through whatever possible paths uh, it, it is able to find. For example, uh, if the link between say Chicago and Austin in our case here were to go down, data would flow through the New York pop. And uh, also it's, it's not like hard coded uh, this topology, it is self-adjusting, and you can uh, just throw out there uh, new nodes and uh, just use an entry point. For example, we, we add uh, a new node there in Houston and only link it to, to, to Austin, but it is only, uh, anyway, it, it, uh, it will properly join uh, and establish whatever links it can. With the, with the other nodes. So the, the whole idea with, with this is that we want to make it easy to manage such a service in an, in an, unified, uh, in an unified way. And um, I'm going to go through a series of uh, services or uh, SIP level features that we expanded upon uh, in order to get this experience out of them. So one of the first ones that benefited from this was the ability, the simple ability, right, to limit your uh, 
some concurrent calls from your inbound traffic, for example. Um, so in this case, we have a customer that we limit to, say, 10 maximum concurrent calls, and we give him access to all of our pops. But what if he does something like this? What if he, he's pushing five calls to, to each of two locations and uh, is attempting to push more toward the, the third one? Well, the platform, even if we're not using like a shared database to, to, to aggregate this data, is able to, the cluster is uh, pretty much handling this part and adding all the counters up and properly uh, doing this limitation. Uh, as far as the configuration goes, it's only a matter of a handful of module parameters uh, using dialog profiles. Uh, and just define this inbound call profile along with uh, the tags. I'll get into the sharing tags concept a bit later, but as you can see, it's, uh, this is all it takes to do the check and the increment part each time we uh, receive more inbound traffic. Um, a different example would be, what about calls per second limitations? This is another commonly uh, requested feature in you know, uh, infrastructure or uh, wholesale type of services. The, the idea is similar. We will only allow some customers to push out uh, a certain amount of calls per second and to, to, some, to some gateways, for example. We, we are limited by the carrier to only push, say, 500 CPS to them. Um, but we do this from separate locations. And what if we, we, we want to push some more traffic out of a third location? Again, using a similar concept, we, the, the clustering layer is aggregating all this data and um, ensuring a consistent view at cluster level, not necessarily at uh, individual location level. And for this, you can use the, the rate limit module along with, as I was saying, the clustering extension to it. Um, you, you see there the pipe replication cluster. And uh, again, it's really easy to set up. Um, it's the, the, the check part pretty much stays the same. But the difference is now all the counters, all the pipes get propagated throughout the cluster and the nodes aggregate this data. And uh, so far, I've been talking about kind of uh, trivial or simple data, right, that we can fully replicate. It's just a bunch of integers, counters and counters. But what if we have more complex data? For example, uh, the SIP registrar. There's a lot of data attached to each contact when you, when you register a phone. For all SIP headers, uh, I don't know, source IPs, call IDs, front tag, two tag and all that stuff. So um, you can, so now comes the problem, how do I manage all this data? Because uh, you may not afford to fully replicate it throughout the cluster. And uh, the user locations, the extensions that we brought in the 2.4 cater to uh, a few types of different models of data sharing. So I'm going to go through them and uh, show you what they're all about. So one of the first ones, as I was saying, you can fully share the data, just like we did before with the counters. We do the same with the user log contacts, right? Uh, easy, easy use of the cluster. We have N nodes, just full mesh, replicate to all of them. And there, there were two basic problems, or important problems, that we needed to, to solve in all of these data sharing models. And those were HA, so what do I do if one of my cluster nodes goes down? And the other one was the pinging problem. And uh, I'll go through, I'll compare each of them in each of the solutions. So in this one, in full sharing, um, you can see here we have an SBC that's uh, front-ending the whole platform and is pushing uh, traffic to the full meshed cluster, uh, throwing out their invites, registers, whatnot and uh, they are uh, equally spread. 
and we can fully afford to lose nodes. For example, uh, node, for some reason, node six has an issue, but the service stays unaffected because, again, the data is fully replicated and the invites can hit a different node and the calls will connect, um, and so on and so forth. The service uh, allows this dynamic scaling uh, quite easily. Uh, and with the, regards to the pinging, this is uh, how the typical situation looks like. You have user agents coming in to your platform from private networks, and uh, it is, it, this responsibility kind of falls on your shoulders to maintain the net bindings live, uh, right? They, they, the traffic uh, egresses towards those, through those net devices and you kind of have to ping them once, each, uh, once every minute in order to, to be able to route calls to these users at any point in time. You may argue that you can use push notifications and, uh, and I fully agree with that, but what if it's just about a bunch of hard phones, death phones, so you're not gonna be able to, we, we still needed to cater to that type of setup as well. So the, uh, there's still many deployments out there uh, using that and uh, yeah, we, we have to solve all these problems and we cannot just say, okay, we, we just use push notifications uh, from now on and don't care about the rest. Um, and uh, with how the clustering layer uh, is self-aware uh, of how many nodes are up, it is also able to partition the, this pinging load. So you will not uh, have extraneous pinging going on, right? Because if you remember, we've replicated that register to all six nodes. So what, they will all six start pinging the, the customers. This is one, uh, that's what I was saying, it's an important problem that we had to solve. And uh, the cluster is able to do this. As you can see in this case, nodes three and six are handling the pinging. And uh, should a node go down, the, the responsibilities shift a bit. So now maybe one and four will originate the pings. Okay. So this is uh, the, the first type of setup. It's great to start out with. It, uh, it is excellent for maybe a proof of concept or a small size business. And the fun part is that it doesn't require any database or external service. It's just open SIPs. But what would be a con? What, what do you feel? You're free to, to raise your hand. What, what is the obvious limitation with this, with this full, full mesh replicating data to all nodes? Sorry? Resources, exactly. It just won't scale that well. You are only going to be able to add so many nodes before uh, network traffic will, will kind of uh, start hitting some weird levels and you will, uh, you're just not gonna, going to be able to add so many, uh, to push so much traffic through it. And so we thought of, okay, uh, maybe some businesses want to, are, are, have reached a certain amount of customers and of subscribers and uh, maybe in the tens of millions. Okay, you're, what do we do then? And uh, we obviously have to uh, outsource all of this data management work. We just cannot keep it into OpenSIP's cache anymore. And so we throw it into some NoSQL database that offers you excellent sharding capabilities and um, we worked on this on offering this model as well. So let's go through the basic problems. And the first one is HA. Well, this is pretty much solved because uh, the data now lives on the bottom layer and it is their responsibility. Well, it's, I don't care, MongoDB handles my, my, my HA or Cassandra, right? Uh, and as far as the OpenSIPS nodes uh, go, they can, so that, that's the middle layer. Uh, any of them can or may go down. The top level load balancer will just use the rest of the ones with no problems. 
And uh, with regards to the NAT pinging, now the nodes can build these uh, specially crafted queries that only return their subset of nodes that they should ping, that they each should ping. And so again, we don't do any uh, extraneous pinging, the, the same problem we had before. So this is how we solve it here. So to sum this one up, it is it has excellent scalability potential, and you benefit from all the data sharding, and uh, maybe you can freely scale your reads or your writes at database level. It is, after all, we don't, OpenSIPS doesn't aim to be a database, right? Um, and again, it's, it's meant for large scale. So the only con I could think of is uh, maybe that pinging query we, we can add some, maybe some caching to it. Just, we just have to see how, uh, how people use it and get some, some feedback on, uh, on, on that side. And then, uh, then there's the third data sharing model uh, where people really want to deploy this kind of cluster using, uh, I mean, straight put it on a public IP. They don't front end it with an SBC giving you the freedom to keep it uh, with, uh, I mean, th we introduce this IP restriction. So if we take a look at, at this setup, Alice registers in Seattle, but even if we were to replicate her data to the bottom pops, we wouldn't be able to reach her from there. So all of a sudden, uh, fully replicating the data doesn't make any sense. We just have to, to let the cluster know where uh, she's reachable from. And we will throw this light metadata records into a, a shared database. For example, they would look like something like this. Uh, I, what? There should have been Alice in there. I don't know why I put Livia. Anyway. Uh, so, I register my AOR, and I'm reachable only from this pop, from the, from the Seattle node. And uh, that's as far as data sharing goes. We only share these, uh, these light records. For example, here's a, uh, how a call would look like. Uh, Bob is trying to reach Alice uh, using the Austin pop. We fetch, we query, say, okay, where is she reachable from? She's reachable from Seattle, and we route the call further there. It's almost like a path mechanism, kind of. Uh, you can also add HA to this. The, there is a tutorial. I'm going to, to share it towards the end. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, some configuration parameters. And as far as the pinging goes, obviously, since we didn't uh, replicate the, uh, the contact information to other pops, uh, they just won't even attempt to ping. Uh, and so the, we don't have any duplicate pings to begin with. And to, to sum this data sharing module, uh, model off, um, it, uh, it is kind of geared towards uh, setups that use a lot of deployments throughout the, the country or the whatever, maybe even cross country, who knows, maybe it's global level, and uh, where you wouldn't necessarily want to replicate uh, all your data like that, and you would rather keep it local. Obviously, if you, if you don't share data uh, between pops, you're not gonna be able to do inter-pop failover, but again, that's, that's up to your, to your requirements. And, uh, Maybe some, some questions you might have with regards to the replication itself. Uh, what if I set some uh, contact flags when I store them? Or what if I set some attributes? Will those get replicated as well? And uh, the answer is yes. All of, of, uh, of the user location data gets replicated. And uh, that's uh, as far as the, the concepts go. I'm going to run through a bit how the script usage feels like. We, we aim to keep everything as easy to use as possible. So 
if you did, I'm not sure how familiar you are with OpenStreetMap, but if you, you did save and look up before, it's just like that, even now. Uh, you only have to enable the preset. For example, this one is the first one, the full mesh replication, and define the cluster, and the save and look up will behave differently now. Uh, with the, the other one, the, the Cassandra one, again, we switch the preset to Cassandra clustering and tell it to use this cluster and the data will live there and be properly managed by all the instances and we, uh, no matter how many we add or subtract from the overall data node set. And the same goes with the last one. It's just a matter of uh, switching like a two, two strings. And uh, with regards to the backends, we currently fully support Cassandra 3.11 and uh, MongoDB, not even sure, I think they are, they are up to four now. I think I saw some ads. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we tested with 3.6, but four should be supported as well, the, the newest one. And uh, if you want to read up more about this, there's quite a lot of info, uh, both in the user location module uh, of the 2.4 docs, or maybe on the blog, or uh, in the tutorial section on the website. Um, okay. Oh, sure. Feel free to take pictures. So it's 2.4. 2.4, yes, starting with that. All, all of these are, are with the 2.4. The Oh yes, the, the, that stuff hasn't. Uh, we haven't pulled that that thing off. So yes, there, uh, there should be time for questions at the end. Just okay. so I know he has a lot of slides to go through. Uh, I think I have like seventy slides, so I'm doing pretty decently. I think twenty more minutes are good. Okay, so uh, another SIP service that we clustered in two point four using the newly added support is the presence support, and. Uh, here we revised uh, the, some typical problems that uh, needed to be solved. And uh, th this is the, the, the basic one. Um, assuming we have sh some presence data shared between some servers that we would want to function in an active backup mode, you would get this kind of problem where they, when, and say, some expiration event uh, triggers for, for some present entity, all of them would notify the, the endpoint. And um, how we circumvent this problem is by introducing the concept of sharing tags. You will, you will see this a lot throughout the cluster modules in 2.4. So basically what, what the idea is behind this abstraction um, is that you often have some responsibility sharing between two servers. These are the typical two examples. Uh, the first one, the top one that you see is where I have a virtual IP shared between these two servers and either of them may uh, have the responsibility for it, but uh, only one can have it at the same time, right? Or, so this is an active backup setup. Or I might want to go for an active active, which is the one at the bottom where uh, I spread the traffic between the, the servers, but I'm able to lose either one of them without losing the service. So th this is an, an, uh, an additional way of achieving HA without wasting half of your servers, basically, like the first one does, right? because the backup is just sitting idle. And uh, to each of the virtual IPs, we would associate this sharing tag. Uh, that pulls the, the data ownership with it. So going back to the HA problem, all of a sudden now the application is aware of the network status of the IP, the shared virtual IP. And uh, OpenSIPS is able to decide upon that state. In this case, the, the VIP tag is active on the first one and backup on the second one. And so the notify is only originated by the first server. If we trigger a virtual IP switch, all of a sudden the second one uh, pushes a notify. 
it's all uh, triggered. So ideally, you would have some hook into the the virtual IP management daemon on your system, and that would call an MI command that would switch the application level sharing tag. And uh, all you have to set are the presence sharing tags, module parameter, and you're able to achieve the HA setup with a presence. A second uh, problem that becomes solvable is the problem of load balancing presence traffic. And how we, we would solve it with sharing tags would be that we now have three tags and each of them is active on each of the servers. And as soon as we detect one of the servers going down, we trigger this MI command that switches the tag to a, possibly a new server and taking over the, the subscriptions and whatnot. Similar to the previous one, we just define them and that's how we achieve the load balancing scenario. Also maybe uh, a, a bit of a concept overlapping with the user location we can federate the data just like we did, uh, did there, where we don't fully replicate it to all the, the pops, uh, and we only, it only lives on, uh, on the ones that are actually relevant. So let's go through that step. Um, say, uh, I could use a pointer. <laughs> say Alice registers on the, on the OpenSIPS A and uh, subscribes there for some, let's say, BLF events of Bob. And then we have the, on the OpenSIPS B, Bob uh, generates this event. It gets broadcasted to all the pops and Alice receives a notification. And then we have uh, the third participant that subscribes. And uh, the, there is this query broadcast throughout the cluster and she Charlie is notified that I, I guess it's it's too complex but uh, she's notified that Alice is online so she receives an inline notification um, and th that's kind of how this setup works uh, the data is only replicated to the servers that needs it that need it you just have to enable federation mode, and uh, that's pretty much it. And you can also put some high availability into it. You can make, you can use pairs of servers in each cluster, uh, in each data center, and uh, coupled with the ter sharing tags mechanism. The, the extensions to the subscribe to the handle subscribe function are you just provide a tag and uh, that's pretty much it there's a lot more info on this on the there's a good blog post about it and uh, the the presence module you can learn about it, a lot more about it there and uh, moving forward we we, uh, I mean, I've talked a lot about local high availability. What do I do if a server goes down, right? But a lot of companies also think about uh, the global level. Okay, what do I do if I lose a whole data center? How does my service uh, cope with that? And the, the typical industry solution is to, to use, uh, sorry, one, one option, or pretty much straightforward, would be to just use DNS, right? You could add some priority. You could uh, instruct your customers to, to j just make use of it. But in practice, you often see that they don't fully support it, or they, they just do some weird caching, and they only route your first entry, or uh, Often the the answer is okay. We'll handle this, and we only give you an IP. We we will dynamically manage this one and uh, what do our own failover if if that should be the case. And 
you can achieve this with any cast. Um, this any cast basically allows you to fully control uh, how traffic is routed within your platform. You can use it uh, to either uh, obtain high availability or to load balance traffic to, uh, towards locations or within locations. You basically how it works is that there are, you have uh, multiple machines with the same IP, and you you have uh, AnyCast enabled or AnyCast capable routers that uh, manage all of this and can uh, communicate between them using uh, some routing protocols like BGP, and they they uh, share routes or path priorities between them such that they uh, choose the proper destination according to the current state of the system. And let's go through some, some SIP examples to understand this better. So we have three servers and each of them has both an Anycast IP and, uh, and an Unicast one. And the customer pushes traffic to the blue one, right, the Anycast. And the, now comes the problem. So the 200 OK routes back using the VIP, which is obviously the, the Anycast. But this time, the, the router load balances it to server number two. Uh, so what do we do in this case? Because it has no transaction state, and we won't be able to route it out. But uh, using the 2.4 support, we added like a special token in the, in the via header, and it is now able to locate, okay, who's the server that really has this transaction? So we don't fully replicate the 200 OK to, to the first box, rather tell it, okay, there, this call was answered, take care of it, and it will now reply upstream. So th this is kind of, uh, there are many, there are multiple ways in which uh, the SIP can fail using any cast. Here's another example. Uh, the call, we have a call initiation, and we, we, want, we, we cancel the call. But uh, we route it to server number two again, with the, the load balancer. So what we do in this case, we broadcast this cancel to all the clustered Anycast nodes such that it can be routed further by the proper node which has the transaction. Uh, of course, to, we can use this even on the, the dialogue level. So it is Anycast uh, capable. You, we only have to use the sharing tags mechanism. Like I said before, each server has, would have its own tag. And uh, if we fail over, to, to a different pop, we enable that tag and the, the data ownership will go towards that node. Uh, in this case, for dialogues, the responsibility is to write CDRs, timeout calls, and do the pinging. But ideally, uh, this has to only be done by a single node. Otherwise, you run into all sorts of problems. Um, so the, how the script looks like, you just we define some some cluster in the transaction module, and add uh, just maybe some handling for the the cancel scenario I talked about earlier, and replicate it to all the nodes part of the cluster. There is a, a lot more about this on. Uh, on the transaction module, there's Rezvan did a, a huge presentation on the summit this year. You can, we have also blog posts about it. Some, the guys from Iron Tech wrote a good piece. Um, and uh, yeah, this was pretty much it. If uh, there is also, if I mean, this is kind of a, kind of late, but if you're if you want to learn more about OpenSIPs and uh, how to build a platform, you know, practices, and how to 
learn more about scripting, security issues, you can, you may join the, the boot camp. We do it in, uh, we alternate between Europe and, and the States and uh, this year which went for Romania. And uh, yeah, this is what we went with in 2.4. We aim to help you build a easy to manage service and easy to, to scale. Uh, and yeah, if you have any more questions, please go ahead. All right, so questions from the audience. Thank you for your patience. Very good. All right. You mentioned sharding yes. at the database level. Um, and since we're not replicating any data, it is, is, are you expecting the actual data structure to be built separately from the sharded structure? Or are you somehow assisting with that process by the way you pass the data to the database level? We, we don't, How, the, the, the database handles all the sharding, right? Right. Yeah, we, we don't. But it's it struck, the, the, struck, the way the data comes would determine how it's sharded on multiple different databases. So your question is, each database has its own way of defining the sharding key, okay. right? Yes. So how, how, do we, how do we handle this problem on, on the different databases? Correct. Uh, personally, I'm not that good with Cassandra sharding, but I can tell you about Mongo at least. Okay. Uh, you can, the, so what the, the index key that we use is like a big integer on the user location data. It's a 64-bit uh, integer. Um, and we could definitely use that as a sharding key. It's pretty random because it's yeah. uh, made up of a hash of the AOR. Like TID, I think it's T um, Well, that's what you call it. CID. CID. CID? Yes, contact ID. Just use and just use the CID to make up a sharding key in MongoDB to, to do that. Um, I got more questions. But, yeah. Yeah. But, but with yeah. Cassandra, again, yeah. I, I would have to look into it. I'm not sure how it handles the sharding. But, yeah. All right, we have multiple ones here, but let's want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. Is there any other questions from anyone? You're up again. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, with the new structure with clustering, how does it affect the mid-registration process? Or does it? It, it doesn't. So I mean, it, will, it will continue to work. The mid-registration can, can work on top of a clustered user location. Uh, because how, uh, how it's implemented currently, it stores all of its uh, additional data. It attaches it to each contact using like a JSON blob. Uh -huh. So that can just as easily be rep and it's all stored in the database, yes, like the old. Exactly, either through the database or uh, replicated uh, throughout the cluster. And for, for, the, for those modules, uh, you, know, you could use MySQL, MariaDB, you could use different databases. But for clustering module, you have to use <laughs> one of the other two? It, it kind of pushes you to use NoSQL. Yeah. We, we, okay. we are thinking about also uh, bringing the SQL part uh, up to par, but we. Uh, I guess, I guess you know. Oftentimes, you push features or build features that your clients kind of push you to do, right? So th that was uh, the case here. Okay. So we we are definitely looking into also ensuring that you can use a clustered SQL database like whatever Percona. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience, real quick? We have one more. Thanks. <laughs> All right, I think you answered this one earlier. It's 2.4 and above. Yes. So we have to upgrade. Um, and then the next one was the, you can switch either run memory or database. That's yes. still there. The default is to use uh, in memory. In memory. Okay, good. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Yes. Big round of applause. You've always been a great speaker.